Hey guys, welcome to Keep On Pushing TV. I am your host, Devon Harris, and our goal hasn't changed. We share ideas and insights that are going to challenge you, insights that are going to inspire you to keep on pushing and live your absolute best life. So I am guessing that you're interested in that, even a little bit. And if you are, you know you're in the right place. So again, welcome to Keep On Pushing TV. There's a stereotype uh, going around about Jamaicans in North America that they typically have more than one job. And, you know, well, you know, our guest today, uh, what I have to say, has, you know, validated that stereotype. You know, based in Toronto, Canada, she is Jamaican, she's a Jamaican-born team building and virtual meeting facilitator, actress, and writer. Uh, she has navigated her business through four economic downturns, the bursting of the dot-com bubble, the 9-11 uh, terrorist attack, SARS, the 2008 meltdown as well. And of course, you all know that we're now dealing with a coronavirus uh, crisis. You know, but the question is, what did she learn? You know, what tools and strategies did she apply to help her to bounce back from those business setbacks? How is she using those strategies right now in the light, in light of the coronavirus crisis? Well, I am looking forward to answers to those questions and more. And so I am really pleased to welcome uh, to the show Anne Thornley Brown. And welcome to Keep On Pushing. Thank you very much. I'm, it's my pleasure to be your guest, one of the original Jamaican bobsledders. Well, you know what? The wonders never cease, do they? <laughs> no. We were actually supposed to meet four years ago at a a conference, IMAX in Las Vegas, when you were speaking, but it didn't work out. But anyway, yeah. we're meeting virtually. Well, yeah, exactly. You know what? If we can't get it done in real life, you know what? We use technology, so it's all good. So, so talk to me, Anne. Uh, I know you're born in Jamaica, and then your yes. family moved to to Montreal. Where in Jamaica are you from, first of all? And you know, well, I'm a Jubilee from? baby, so I was oh, born. In, yes, I am. I was born in Kingston, and then um, my parents went back to country because my dad was getting to my, ready to migrate to Canada to go to Miguel. So uh, my one grandmother's from Trinity and the other from Baileysville, right near Port Maria. So ah, I spent okay. the first two years of my life in the Port Maria area. Nice. So, so we have that in common, in common as well. I was born in Jubilee Hospital as well. Um, oh, really? Oh, there's so many Jubilee babies around. I guess so. Uh, and so you... So you moved to Montreal when you were two years old? Yeah, I was about two and a half. Um, yeah. My dad was studying at McGill. And then uh, about a year after he went up, my mom joined him. And I stayed with my grandma, you know, just like any other Jamaican kid in that situation. Right, right. Okay. So what, was, uh, what were those early, early years in Montreal, Montreal like? It was a lot of fun. Uh, I had no memories of Jamaica from before I left because I'm mm -hmm. so young. I played in the snow, happily on the streets of Montreal with the other kids. It was a very multicultural neighborhood. In fact, there was every nationality and racial group except mine. There weren't many Black families, and there were not many Caribbean families at all. Yeah. So it was like oh, the United did Nations. You, did you feel out of place uh, uh, during those days, or you just felt normal? No, up until preteen years. I played happily. I had lots of friends. It's once you get to the stage of dating that you're going to start to face rejection. But that's a whole other interview. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> indeed. So what, what uh, I know you, you ended up uh, after, you know, your studies to, to become a therapist and a counselor. Yes, what, yes. How was it that uh, inspired you to choose that career path? Well, I originally wanted to be an actress or a writer and my uh, <laughs> or a teacher and my dad was a teacher right he, he studied at micah and he said okay if you want to be a teacher you got to pay your own university so i guess i was becoming more aware of social issues racial issues injustice because i was starting to experience racial discrimination and i was more aware of poverty and and the fact that we don't have a level playing field so i think that's really what got me interested in in social work i wanted to make a difference Mm. So you, you made that transition, though, from social work to, to training. 
Um, and, and yeah, it was a bit, it was a bit of a long transition. I uh, I was a social worker for seven and a half years. I did it in Jamaica. I actually went back to Jamaica and I worked at the University Hospital of the West Indies as a medical social worker. Then I moved to Toronto and I was a therapist and I, I worked and counseled families. And I did my MBA part time. And when I graduated, I wanted to move into business because I, I had co-authored a book called West Indians in Toronto, Implications for Helping Professionals. Mm -hmm. And that got me speaking, leading workshops, diversity workshops before the term diversity was even invented. And there wasn't much opportunity to do that full time in the social services. I wanted to move into business. And people kept saying, you don't have any business experience. Right. So I ran into a huge obstacle. Mm. And, and so how did you get past those obstacles to get a, a foothold into the business world? Well, since I had an MBA, I thought, okay, instead of focusing on where I want to be, which is, you know, in training and development, I, let me focus on where my MBA can get me. And at the time, the banks were hiring people with MBAs uh, for management development, management um, development programs. And we were trained to be commercial account managers. So I did that for two full years as a way of getting some business experience. Right. Uh, and and that, that kind of launched you to, that was a beginning of where you are now, I would say. Yes, because I, by the way, I absolutely hated the experience. <laughs> I, I just, it was, it was just, a medicine that you had to take, huh? It was, it wasn't creative, you know, and, and I have an outgoing personality and in the bank, you have to be really quiet and follow all these policies and procedures. Mm -hmm. But ever since I worked at the bank, no one has ever said to me again, you don't have business experience. So I took some time off. I focused on my acting. And when I ran out of money, then I applied again for a training and development position. And guess what? I got in. Ah, yes. Talk, I started to do management development for companies. Let's talk about your acting briefly, because I know you, you are, you're a part of a, you appear in a Netflix series. Yes, I have been really blessed. Last year, I auditioned for Self Made Inspired by the Life of Madam C.J. Walker. Mm. And actually, the first day I auditioned was when they had the Raptors parade in Toronto, and there was so much excitement in the air. I was so pumped. So I went to the audition. They called me back, I think, three or four more times, and then I heard, I got the part. So I play Annabeth, and, and I'm in the first episode in three scenes, and I have lines in one of them. I got oh. to work with Octavia Spencer and Blair Underwood, who I oh. found out just a few years ago is married to my cousin. Oh, wow. It's what a small world. It is a small world. So, so you're, in the, you're now in the family business, huh? Acting. Well, yeah, exactly. I'm not the only one in the family who's been in the entertainment business. I have a hip hop producing cousin named Focus Three Dot, who has won multi platinum Grammy Awards. Oh, wow. So wow. we've got a little bit of it in our blood. I, and I get this I'm related to Bram Stoker. Yes, the writer. Mm. So wow. there you go. All right, cool. So, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, um, and, you know, in my intro introduction, that you have experienced, you know, so many business setbacks, you know, and it's primarily because of the global dynamics, what was happening in yes. the marketplace, as opposed to, you know, how you were running your business. Um, and we're going to explore those in a minute, but I, I'm kind of curious about, you know, is there an overall lesson that you have taken away from all those experiences? The main thing I've taken from this is that number one, you really have to diversify. You have to have multiple streams of revenue and it's extremely important not to just focus on one target market. I know a lot of the experts say, yes, become laser beam focused. But mm -hmm. if you do that and that market gets hit, you really have to create. So yes, you have to have a basket of skills and services, but be ready to be flexible and deploy them in various areas as the economy and the world around you changes. Mm. So are you saying that, you know, when somebody is starting out or, you know, even if they've been in business for a while, yes. uh, in the marketplace for a while, they should look to develop other, other skills other, other than their core skills so that when yes. we have a crisis, they can fall back on those skills? Exactly. So it's a question of, in my case, uh, I, yes, I'm running my own business, but I also had my acting going and some writing. So that mm -hmm. all of that helped. 
And also don't just focus on one industry. There's one mistake I made very early on is I was really focused on high tech and telcos. And after the NASDAQ tanked in February of 2001, all of a sudden the phone stopped ringing. So mm -hmm. my focus was too narrow. Right. So let, let's talk about some of those, uh, you know, downturns in the market. Yeah. So you have the NASDAQ, um, you had the terrorist attack in, uh, in yeah. 2001 as well. Um, the, the SARS outbreak, of course, the, the financial meltdown in uh, 2008. Uh, you yes. know, and now we're about, we're now in the middle of the coronavirus crisis. Those, yes. those, all those incidents um, from back in the past, um, how did, in what way did they impact your business, uh, your in re revenue stream, and you know, let's talk a little bit afterwards about how, you know, how you're able to make that transition. Okay, let's start with when the dot-com bubble burst. Now, I can remember in February 2001, driving along the, the Don Valley Parkway and hearing that the stock markets were going higher and higher. And I thought, oh, maybe I should invest. And at the time, I had about 50 grand in the bank, right? Mm -hmm. Well, before I could do anything, everything fell apart and the phone stopped ringing in, in the Toronto area. I just wasn't getting any calls. Fortunately, in January 2001, a month before this, I had started doing work in Asia. And that year I went to Asia, I think something like four times. It was really quite lucrative, I did well. So the those fact that I had training, diversified health. I'm sorry, were those all training on team development workshops? Yeah, or? workshops. Mm -hmm. I was doing workshops in places like Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, Singapore. That year I also went to India uh, at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So that helped, all of that helped. Right, so, so that's the, the NASDAQ. Uh, how, it, you know, of course we had the, the financial meltdown. Let's talk about 2001 because I think, yes. you know, that was such a impactful event, oh. let's say. Um, you know, people were scared to travel. Um, people were, con you know, companies were cutting back significantly. Yes. How, in, in, was there a particular way in, in which that event impacted your business? Well, it's interesting because my business was just picking up from locally from February and, and how that happened was I contacted every executive I knew and I was also mailing out these promotional postcards. It was actually a, a photo I'd taken in Jamaica and I used it as a metaphor for the, my company, which the original company was the training oasis. Anyway, what happened was I was, I'd gone to a, film festival party and the next day I was riding downtown to deliver a gift bag to an actress who was supposed to be at the party but who came after I left. I turn on the news and they're saying the first thing I heard was this is going to destroy the economy for many years and I went uh oh and then I drove then they said they were evacuating buildings in downtown Toronto so I went home turned on the tv and I saw the plane crash into the building. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was North America, the business was just dead. For a while, planes weren't even flying. Right. But eventually, the planes started again, and I was able to fly out and do more business in Asia. And really, the Asian business sustained me until things started to pick up again in North America. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then in 2008, the crisis, I know you were doing some, you know, luxury kind of training. How... Oh, okay, how that came about, yeah. <laughs> how that came about was uh, we had SARS. SARS hit, uh, it actually hit Toronto and Asia, right? Mm -hmm. So I left on what was supposed to be my biggest tour ever. I was supposed to go to Beijing. I was supposed to go to Indonesia, the Phil uh, uh, not the Philippines, uh, Thailand. I was supposed to go to Dubai, you know, all these places I was supposed to go. And then uh, Bush was talking about having a war, so Dubai fell off. Right. And then Beijing got canceled. I still flew via Beijing. And then I ended up doing work in uh, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, also Thailand, Bangkok, India. And when I was on the, getting on the plane to go to India, I was told that the Singapore workshop had been canceled because most of the people were coming with jet and the Maoists were 
demonstrating and nobody can get to the airport. Right. So by the time I got back to Toronto, everything was dead, like dead, dead, dead. Nothing was shooting, so I couldn't make any money off acting. Nothing was happening in Asia. Nothing was happening in Toronto. Mm -hmm. I was terrified. So I met with a coach and he helped me to uh, really rethink my business offer and my branding. And I launched a new brand, a new website. I made it very luxurious. And then I started attracting luxury companies to do everything from facilitating team building and executive retreats to also doing corporate events for them, which mm -hmm. is something I've never even thought of doing. Interesting. So you go from kind of uh, just uh, training uh, to uh, becoming a meeting planner. Yeah, because what happened was I was doing team building and executive retreats and I would plan the whole thing from start to finish for the company. Mm -hmm. And I always, I guess because of the Jamaican in me, I always made it fun and colorful and there's music and activities. So companies would have me in to facilitate their executive retreats. And when they wanted to do just something just for fun, they said, you know, we had a great time. We want you back. But this time we don't want to learn anything. We just want you to plan yeah. something for <laughs> some fun. So that's yeah. how I kind of fell into it. I didn't even search for it. My clients started to ask for it. Indeed. So it's, you know, as I'm listening to you, and you know, it just seems like, you know, all these uh, incidents have taken place and you have had to reinvent yourself, you know, a number of times because yeah. of these business setbacks. And um, what advice would you have for someone who, you know, maybe they're just starting out, you know, perhaps, you know, all of us right now are, a little bit in a quandary, uncertain about yes. you know what's on the horizon, and we may, in fact, need to reinvent ourselves. Um, what, yes. what advice would you have for them? Well, the first thing is, if you have any services that you can take virtual, do it. It's something I've been resisting myself because, you know, the technology. I hate to charge somebody for something and something goes wrong, but we're at the point now where we all kind of have to do that. So that's the first thing go virtual. Secondly, use your network. So every executive you know, call them. Every colleague you know, call them. And I also want to put in a word of caution. Don't expect that everyone's going to come through for you. Because in 2008, you know, everything was dead. We know that, right? And I contacted some people who I had referred a lot of business to. They ended up in Asia because of me. And one of them, instead of saying, yeah, you know what, let's work together. You know what he said to me? He said, Anne, it's okay to be hungry, but never let people know you're hungry. Mm -hmm. That's how he reacted. I didn't react like that when he approached me a few years earlier and asked me, you know, for referrals to Asia. So reach out to your network, but understand that some people are going to disappoint you. And you know what? It's a blessing. It's better to know who you have in your corner and who you need to cut out of your, your orbit. Yeah. So that would be my, my advice. And then the other piece that I'd say is extremely important. As you take time now to self-isolate and pause and reflect, start to come up with other streams of revenue. Could be based on your hobbies or your passions, but never allow yourself to have all your eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it, I, I often say that uh, crisis, as a, the athlete in me, sees crisis as preparation, training. You know, when we go to a, yes. a competition, that the stress and the challenge of that competition is preparing you for the next one. And I kind of see crisis, uh, a life crisis as preparing us for the, the next one that's about to hit. And we have that's had right. all of the, these over the last number of years, as we were discussing, that has in a way, prepared us for this one, right? Uh, yes. you know, people say, you know, Devon, but this is just, this is unprecedented. It's earth shattering. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, yeah, but in, in a way we have been prepared. And, you know, you've kind of touched on d just a, a couple of nuggets that I think, as I ask you about reinventing yourself, um, but, uh, but I think they apply, even if you're not re reinventing yourself, you're trying to navigate uh, the, this challenging time, right? Mm -hmm. um, Self-reflection, you just spoke about that. Uh, you know, how important is that? Just kind of taking time out during this slowdown period to reevaluate re your life and get in touch with you. 
It's extremely important. And it's important whether you're going through an economic crisis or a health crisis. Uh, three years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. I don't know if you know that. No, I didn't actually. Yeah, yeah I didn't tell many people at first mm -hmm. because I was, I was devastated. I didn't see it coming, right? I knew there were certain illnesses in my family, but I did not know that my grandmother had had cancer and so did her sister. Mm -hmm. I was not prepared. And I needed to really take that time when I was healing for self-reflection and to really figure out what legacy do I want to leave in the world? Mm -hmm. What do I want to do? And I started, as a result of that, doing some writing. I had been researching my family tree from when I was 18. Around the same time, I started training for social work. I wanted to know more about my roots. And it took a long time for the tools to be available for me to trace my grandfather's families. Mm -hmm. But once I did that and I connected with family members, I, I uncovered so much about my family and all my cousins started saying, are you going to write a book? Are you going to write a play? Are you going to write a script? So while I was recovering from cancer, my calendar was clear and I was able to, to write. I wrote a pilot for a TV series and uh, a novel. So, you know, dig deep within you and figure out what are your talents? What are your skills? What are some things you've been wanting to do for a long time and you haven't had time to do it? Now's the time. See yeah. it as an opportunity and seize it. I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, you, you, you have more time on your hands and it's not just about, you know, what you're doing physically, whether you're planning a meeting or, uh, yeah. you know, booking flights or whatever it is, you, you, you use the word legacy. You know, and, I, and I usually say, hey, you know, what impact do you want to make in the world that's beyond yourself? And just that's being right. able to slow down and think about those things, uh, in a slower time period really adds more meaning to your life. Right? It does. It really does. And once you see that as an overarching umbrella, then you can zero in on, okay, what are some of my options for earning an income? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's perhaps where, you know, you so wisely sought a coach at one point. And, and yes. That, yes. That's I've done that a couple of times actually. <laughs> Yeah. You know, when you're stuck, well, you, I, you're an athlete. I don't even have to tell you. You know more about this than I do. Yeah. But when you're stuck and you're not making progress, that coach can help you keep on pushing, as you put it, right? It and, and even when you're you know, stuck or confused or just uncertain, uh, you know, as many of us are in this time, you know, that, that person is going to see something in you that you perhaps didn't see in yourself. That's um, right. You also spoke earlier about, uh, and I think it's important, so I'm bringing it up again, you know, just, you know, improving your skills. Uh, yes. and, I, and I encourage people to do that. It's not, you know, learning technical skills as, uh, and adding to your repertoires is important, but also those soft skills are going to come in handy, aren't they? They are. They're, they're extremely important, and they will help you navigate and get yourself through the crisis. The other thing we haven't touched on is uh, really getting the support you need. And mm -hmm. for me, it's been prayer. It's been support from my church community. They have been there for me every step of the way. Mm -hmm. And in fact, once I had the problems with cancer and I had a couple of other issues, I started going really regularly for prayer. I even saw a priest for 10 days and I'm not even Catholic, <laughs> right? Yeah. He did something with me called a contemplative retreat in daily life. Mm. Father Carl, uh, I was in Montreal at the time temporarily, and it, it made a huge difference. It was a game changer for me. So and the other sounds... thing I did, which might, some people might find helpful, I, I finally had the time to do The Artist Way by Julia Cameron. It's a wonderful book, mm. self-development and coaching, and helps you really tap into your creativity. There you so some, those are some of the things that helped me. So, so it's, you know, it's, it, I think you touched on two important points there. One is, you know, um, tapping into uh, support that's around yes. you. You know, you, everybody needs a team, right, to help them to succeed. And the other is this, the whole business of self-care. You know, so you were taking time out to, um, to pray, you know. And yes. They may not pray, but they may practice yoga or they, they practice meditation. Absolutely. It's really important to kind of connect and, uh, you know, quiet our mind and become more yes. mindful um, 
uh, because just, just the stress of the crisis, and you're absolutely right. I mean, we're kind of focusing on the coronavirus crisis, but then there are other crises that hit us, you know, whether it's a health or relationship or financial crisis. And I think the, the principles um, and the strategies that we have been sharing over the last half an hour or so, I think applies to all of them. They do, because when there's a crisis, it's almost like we're really distracted. Our mind is cluttered and we're focusing on all of the obstacles. And we really have to find a way to quieten ourselves down and listen to that small voice within. It could mm -hmm. mean, for me, getting into nature and going for walks. Bodies of water work for me a lot, I guess, because I, di I didn't even remember it, but at my grandmother's house, there was a river that ran right behind her house. So maybe right. there's something there for me. So mm -hmm. when I go to Jamaica, for example, I always go to places with waterfalls and it just clears my head, you know? Yeah. And in mm -hmm. Canada, of course, um, I'm more going to ponds and lakes, places like that. They're very soothing and can relax you and help you to refocus. Indeed. Now, now you know, everything that we spoke about um, in terms of self-care and reaching out to yes. others and, um, you know, developing your skills, mm -hmm. um, obviously helps to improve you the person which is yes. most important that's a, that's what you bring to the world right mm -hmm. um as you are reinventing yourself and as we find ourselves in the midst of this particular crisis and with the uncertainty you know as a as a trainer and i know you have as a true jamaican all these other irons in the fire <laughs> <laughs> but you know as a trainer i think about like the the, the hospitality industry that is so wide you know from it is. meetings and conferences and transportation workers and so on and so forth meeting planners um any advice for them and in terms of how they begin to navigate this yeah. well try and do some virtual meetings get in touch with your clients and find out how you can help for example, you and I are both in Jamaica and we know the hotel, right now the borders are closed, right? right. So the hotels are losing revenue. Everybody in the tourist industry is, is losing rev revenue. So one of the things I'm doing is I'm reaching out to venues and hotels, in initially Jamaica and the Toronto area. Mm -hmm. And I'm coming up with some co-marketing for the fall. In fact, I've already launched a spring into fall promotion Mm. That if people book their executive retreats or team building now, okay, right. that I'll be giving them certain bonuses for their team. And I'm also giving away 10% of all the revenue I generate from that to help other people who have been impacted by this. Indeed. Um, the other thing I'm doing is ebook sales. And that's something I think a lot of people can do in the uh, hospitality and event planning industry find out what your skill set is and package it up, whether it's a webinar or whether it's a podcast or an ebook, and you can generate revenue that way and help other people. So that's what I'm doing. And I'm, I already have a whole collection of ebooks and they're to do with marketing, training and development and event planning businesses. I have some on launching a career in training or event planning and anybody who purchases these, they're going to get several benefits. First of all, normally I bundle this with 20 minutes of telephone coaching or Zoom coaching. Mm -hmm. well, I have, I've upped that to a full hour. So all mm -hmm. these people are calling me for free coaching. You know what? Buy an ebook. You're going to get one hour of complimentary right. coaching and 25% of everything that I bring in, I'm going to give it to somebody in need. I have a couple of families I've adopted in Jamaica. We all need to do our small part. You know, some people can give their services away for free. I'm not in a position to do that, yeah. but I'm in a position to generate revenue and take some of it and give it away to help people. So in those strategies, you know, you have practically touched on all of the things that we've been discussing, you know, yes. uh, reinventing yourself, you know, figuring out what your, your core skill sets are and then finding a way to monetize that. You know, exactly. Creative, you know, going beyond yourself and helping others, you know, making an impact. And that is so important. It's not mm -hmm. just about us. When I was going Great. through a really rough period, that same priest who advised me said, you know what? Helping isn't just for when you're doing well. When yes. you're not doing well, you need to find who you can help. And I started to volunteer 
every Friday night at a program that served meals and gave clothing to the homeless. Mm -hmm. I think I got more out of it than they did. It was a tremendous blessing. I even got to practice my French because this is in Montreal. You know, you uh, always get a blessing. You know, I always say that, you know, when you help others or when you encourage others, it, it is the most altruistic and at the same time selfish thing you could ever do. Absolutely. It's, it's so al- rewarding. It's yes. so rewarding. You're helping somebody, but it's impossible to help others without at the same time help yourself in some way, shape or form. So, Anne, I mean, this has been enlightening. And, and uh, you know, you know you. two Jamaicans get together, they can chat forever. Yeah, um, we can. But uh, tell, tell me, you know, uh, you know, and I'm going to share a number of links. Um, sure. Uh, you know, w- w- when, when we post this, but if someone wanted to find you for your books and your coaching or yeah. uh, to book one of your training uh, programs, how would they find you? Okay, well, you can get me a number of places. Uh, my website is executiveoasis.com, and that's for at team building, executive retreats, virtual meetings, and keynotes, mm-hmm. executiveoasis.com. If someone's interested in training and development programs, I have that with my original company, thetrainingoasis.com, thetrainingoasis.com. I post on LinkedIn every day. In fact, I increased my posting. Yeah. And I will continue to do that. And I've actually launched a brand new virtual simulation called Lemons to Lemonades, Seizing Opportunities Out of Adversity When Business Goes Sour. So I'll be posting about that on LinkedIn and on my Executive Oasis website. Um, so uh, that's a simulation. It's for associations or companies that want to really reinvent themselves. There's an ebook that's going to go along with that. Mm-hmm. And I will be posting on LinkedIn. And anybody who wants to connect with me, just pop me a connection request. Indeed. Lemons to lemonade. Such a, an approach. Lemons to lemonade. Yeah. You know, when I used to go visit my grandma in Jamaica, I got introduced to something called lime squash. Do you know it? Yeah, of course. That's, yeah. That's, you know, and I'll it's really cool. Lemonade, although it's not lemonade, it's really limeade or lime squash. Yeah, because we more have lime in Jamaica, right? Yeah, absolutely. But I got thinking about whole meta- metaphor about when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And heck, mm-hmm. there's so many things you can do. You can make li- lime squash. I've been to India. I've done business in India, but they have something called fresh lime soda. You can make Alcoholic beverages, there's the hard lemonade, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, There's just so many things you can do with lemonade and it's a perfect metaphor for really transforming yourself as the world around you evolves. I I absolutely agree. And you know, it it really uh, epitomizes everything that you have been through, you have experienced, the way you have come through it. You know, definitely, you know, a keep on pushing moment or a few keep on pushing moments. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Um, and you're bobsledding. I mean, that's such a powerful metaphor for what people are going through. Because, you know, when I watch the footage of you guys, it's just, it's so fast. I mean, to me, it's terrifying to watch. <laughs> it's so <laughs> fast and it's moving and you got to keep up with it. Otherwise, remember one time the sled, uh, tipped over, yep. but you mm-hmm. guys, you know what? You got up and you carried that sled across the finish line. My gosh, that's a Jamaican inspiration right there. Uh, thank you. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the speed is terrifying for me personally. Uh, well, it's terrifying. It's more, it's more terrifying for me to watch it than to be in the middle of it because I, yeah. when I'm on a sled driving, I feel I have now, more. Were, which p- position were you in on the sled? Uh, on the four-man sled, I was a number two guy. Uh, that was wow. back in 98. But then I became a driver and I drove in 92 and 98. And that, that's just so... That must have been... I mean, I'm terrified of roller coasters. I can't even <laughs> yeah. imagine. Really? Now, some of you guys did a helicopter business, right? Uh, yeah. Dud- Dudley Stokes did a, a helicopter business. So, wow. Um, he, and you were doing helicopter tours of Jamaica. Indeed. I think that's so exciting. Indeed. There's so many ways to reinvent yourself. Always. I, and, I, and I think, uh, you know, that, that's why your contribution to the show is so valuable, especially in a time like this, actually. So, again, thank you for figuring out how to turn lemons into lemonade, you know, for, by reinventing yourself, because I think it really 
ties in nicely with this um, philosophy of keep Thank on. you. Thank you very much for having me on as a guest. And Indeed. keep on pushing. I, I plan to, absolutely. Thanks for watching. If you haven't done so yet, make sure you click on that subscribe button and hit that bell. You'll get a notification every time we post a new video. And don't forget, share it with your friends, man. They want to be inspired as well, right? So share it. Don't keep it. And before you go on to the next video, visit my website, www.devonharris.com. Keep on pushing.